Hello, respected viewers. It's George from Ireland here. So, ooh, I hope you're not too blinded by the sun there. I have to keep my head in this position. Well, I think I, think I can cope without these. See how we go. Um, so this video is going to be about um, should Franco be reburied? Uh, because it's um, it come up as an issue in Spanish politics lately. And as you can possibly tell by the blazing uh, solar radiation behind me, I am in Spain. And so here in, in, in sunny Spain, they're discussing um, his reinterment. Um, re, um, so uh, let me see. So first of all, who was he? Francisco Bahamonde Franco. Um, he was known as El Caldillo when he ruled here, as in the leader. Um, so he ruled Spain mainly from 1936, wasn't fully in power to 1939, um, but until his death in 1975. And uh, he was regarded um, by uh, his admirers as the savior of the country, who uh, ruled with a steady hand and gradually lifted the country out of um, uh, turmoil and the threat of uh, vicious Stalinist oppression, maintained the country's independence and unity, and allowed economic development and so on. Now, his critics would say that uh, he was a fascist tyrant. Um, anyway, so he is currently uh, uh, resting for all eternity in Valle de los Caídos, Forgive me if I mispronounced that. Um, it, it may come as a surprise. I'm actually not a Spaniard, but there we go. go. The Valley of the Fallen is what that means. It's some way north of Madrid. And um, after the Spanish Civil War ended in 1939, he had uh, many prisoners of war build that. It was built over years. And uh, people who'd been killed in the Civil War on his side, the nationalist side, um, they uh, were buried there with great honor. And there was a huge um, uh, mausoleum for him. And when he finally uh, dropped off his perch in 1975, um, he was put in there. So uh, he was born in Ferrol, which is the very northwest um, corner of Spain on the Atlantic coast. I suppose Galicia, you would call it. Now, Galicia is quite a distinctive region of Spain. There's a Galician uh, language, or I, 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 arguably dialect. He was a di dictator, many people would say that. Um, he wielded almost untrammeled power and um, it was a one-party state. There was uh, um, the, the uh, parliament, um, Cortes, but uh, people say, oh, come on, it was a rubber stamp. So uh, I think it would be fair to say it was a dict dictator, yes. Um, so Ferrol, that, that town, became known as Ferrol del Caudillo, Ferrol of the leader in his lifetime, but they dropped the bit del Caudillo. Um, so Galicia's got its own dialect, or arguably language. It's due north of Portugal. But um, I'm not sure, I saw the Civil War bullet holes in the walls. You can see it in many places, uh, Peter Clark. Um, so they've got a distinctive identity there. The Spanish language is really Castilian, from Castile, as in central Spain, the area around Madrid, Toledo, Segovia, and so forth. But I'm not sure if he really was uh, Galician by his ancestry, but he completely didn't uh, identify with the cause of, of, of Galician national, uh, you know, national independence or autonomy or anything like that. He wanted the unity of Spain and the colonies such as they existed. Because he was born in the 1890s, remember the Philippines, Puerto Rico, um, and I can't think where else, Cuba. They were all Spanish ruled at the time. There were Spanish colonies in Africa, what we now call Equatorial Guinea, Western Sahara, um, and the northern section of Morocco. Um, so he wanted to retain all those. Um, anyway, um, so uh, his father was some bureaucrat in the Navy, um, and they were a middle-class family. Remember, Spain was, within Western Europe, it was one of the least developed countries. Uh, the last to industrialize, just things were not in great shape. There was, there was still severe poverty, and not everyone was literate, even in the late 19th century. Not everyone could speak Spanish. They often spoke their regional languages, like Basque, Catalan, uh, Valenciano, and so forth. Um, so, I mean, if, amongst other Western European countries, Spain was, was a byword for failure. We don't want to end up like Spain, because if you look back to the 16th century, Spain was the mightiest power on Earth, ruling in the American continent, every, from, everything from California down to Tierra del Fuego, um, was so wealthy. Um, ships sailed back across the Atlantic along the Spanish main, just laden with gold and silver. Uh, and despite uh, Spain's incredible wealth and the huge population of its empire didn't develop politically, was still uh, a despotic state, um, was still obscurantist, the Catholic Church censoring so much, didn't develop um, in, um, in economically or invent anything or make any scientific breakthroughs. Uh, so it really lagged behind and sort of by, by around 1900 was very feeble. And one of the seminal 
events of his childhood was of the defeat of, of Spain in the, the Spanish-American War. The United States beat them, uh, and the United States took Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and so on. So he didn't want to have that happen again. He was not too keen on Americans the rest of his life, though he had to keep that quiet when he needed their help after the Second World War. And he, he, he uh, really didn't like um, democracy, sort of as a sort of a Protestant thing, a free Masonic plot, okay? Or hardly any Freemasons in Spain, but he had this bee in his bonnet that they were always up to no good. So he became an army officer, and by all accounts, he was a diligent one, brave, willing to put himself in harm's way. You might think he was utterly wicked, and many people detest him, but he didn't lack for physical courage. So he served in Africa. When we say that, we're really talking about Morocco. Wasn't he in Spain around uh, Corazal, just to make sure about those bullets? Spain is a sad story, now but enormously important in ancient times. I don't know where that is, I have no idea. So uh, fighting in northern Morocco against the Rifts, the Rifts of Moroccan people. So remember 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But the same year that um, the, the, the North Africans, the Moors were finally defeated in Granada and uh, Isabella and Ferdinand, the Catholic monarchs, came to rule the whole of Spain. They didn't officially unite it into a single realm until 1700. When you look at the Spanish flag, you'll see the two pillars, the pillars of Hercules. Remember, the Straits of Gibraltar represent the pillars of Hercules, according to the um, uh, ancient Greek myth that uh, Hercules had to hold up the world there. So one foot on the European side and one foot on the African side, and there he is holding up the sky. It's not holding up the world, sorry. And um, so then the, the, the Latin words plus ultra on the Spanish flag, meaning even further. So when they got to um, the southern coast of Spain, they, they, that momentum carried them over the Straits of Gibraltar uh, into Africa, into Morocco in particular. And so for centuries they ruled uh, the northern section of Morocco. Now, um, a lot of Spanish people actually have North African descent, but their ancestors were forced to convert to Christianity in 1492. Yes, I'm right, neat monologue. Thanking you, Peter Clark. Forgive me if I mispronounce your cognomen. So um, anyhow, uh, the, the, the um, Moroccans were Muslim almost to a man. Well, there are a few Jews and they didn't want to be ruled by Spain, and they didn't speak the Spanish language, and blah, blah, blah. And um, Christianity, particularly the Catholic version, was very important to the Spanish, who were about 99% Catholic at the time. And the government really emphasized that. But in the late 19th century, it was a growing liberal and secular movement saying, you know, why don't we have free and fair elections for all men? Shouldn't women get rights? We don't like the monarchy that much, and we have secularism. You can be a Catholic, you can go to church, but the Catholic church shouldn't be um, laying down the law to us on all sorts of issues, whether you can get divorced or not, what we can publish in a book or a newspaper, what we can say in the theater. Um, okay, uh, said fellow was obscurantist, always taking the side of the wealthy against uh, the impecunious. Um, but anyway, he was really an ultra-conservative. Um, and then uh, there was a lot of unrest in Spain. Spain remained neutral in the First World War. There was some financial gain for Spain uh, because they were able to sell things to both sides. Um, but um, there was a lot of radicalism, particularly in Catalonia, this very northwest region of Spain bordering France, the most economically advanced part of the, part of the country, and there were trades unions. Despite it being the wealthiest, it, uh, the trades unions were the most uppity, demanding this and that and higher wages. I suppose there was organized labor. People in big cities more confident more politically conscious than um, uh, laborers in the countryside on farms. So there were anarchism and communism became quite popular here. And so it, politics became increasingly polarized and there was a bifurcation between people who supported the Republic, who opposed it, so I sorry, supported the, the monarchy and those who opposed it. The monarchy was quite um, politically involved, was not neutral, was partial towards conservative forces. And there were several political parties. They did have um, Cortas Españoles, as in the, the, the parliament, um, and um, there are various conservative parties and various more uh, left-wing and radical parties. So anarchism, communism, social democracy uh, were, were popular in, in, in Spain, particularly in Catalonia. There was the idea of Catalan nationalism, autonomy for Catalonia, or even outright independence, likewise the Basque country. Um, so um, the Catalan language is a Romance language closely related to Spanish. Basque is not. It's a bit of a mystery language. It's not related to Spanish. It's not Latin-based at all. And there are various other dialects like Valenciano or Galician. Um, so uh, that's that. But he really believed in emphasizing that central Spanish identity and using the Castilian language and all the rest of it. And Catholicism must be the state religion. Um, and he absolutely detested uh, communism and anarchism, which he felt was an attack on civilization, which was just destructive. This was sheer vandalism. And it was a foreign plot. The Masons came up, to, uh, up with it. There was still a bit of anti-Semitism in Spain, including in him. 
um, even though there were very few Jewish people here. After 1492, the Jews had been forced to convert. Some of them actually pretended to convert. They went through the motions with, of Christianity as much as, as necessary and possible, but um, as, as much as they could, they secretly part practiced Judaism. Sometimes they had to be seen to eat pork in public, offered pork in public to see if someone grimaced. Is this person um, a crypto Jew? Um, and is this person trying to avoid working on the Sabbath or things like that? Um, but the, 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 um, the secret Jewish people, they somehow knew who they were, each other, was able to signal to each other and keep this community going underground into the 1980s when they finally came out, okay, we have secretly practiced Judaism for um, almost 400 years and we're coming out now, we feel it's safe to reveal that we've been doing this. Um, because remember, until that time, Spain had a, perhaps the largest Jewish community in Western Europe because it'd been, um, Spain had been largely Muslim until them, or certainly Muslim ruled, and the Jews were much better treated by Muslims than by Christians until that time. Um, so fast forward a bit, lots of trade unions, lots of strikes, and he had to go to certain regions of Spain and crush some of these strikers. There were some Moroccans who took his side, so he did have some Muslim troops under his command, and uh, he crushed uh, strikes and, and riots with an iron hand, many would say brutally. So the, the Republic was proclaimed in 1941 and 1931, sorry, and the monarchy was abolished. King Alfonso XIII went into exile in Rome. Um, well, fast forward, there was a growing political violence, assassinations of various politicians of left and right. And left and right, they were not um, monoliths, there were several parties on either side, and there, were, there was considerable controversy, considerable disagreement amongst the left wing and the right wing on both sides. But anyway, uh, July 1936, there'd been a disputed election the left had got more votes than the right, obviously there were centrists as well, but um, various um, right-wing generals and the, the military top brass was, was right-wing almost without exception, decided that they would, um, they would uh, launch a golpe de estado, as in, as in a, a coup. There had been a military government under the monarchy in the, in the 20s under uh, um, uh, Primo de Rivera, Miguel Primo de Rivera, and his son, uh, Antonio Primo de Rivera, then led this party called Falange Española, as in phalanx. Phalanx as in those Macedonian formations of pikemen, but it just was just this political party. Remember fascism had risen at the time, and what do fascists believe? Well, they're ultra-nationalists, they emphasize national unity, chauvinism, they're anti-feminist, a bit anti-intellectual. Um, they tend to favor the major religious domination, whatever that is. Um, they didn't really like the internationalism of, of, of Christianity. Um, now they'd have a blend of socialism and, and capitalism, things like that. They'd be militarists. Um, they'd favor some sort of corporate state, uh, quite traditional in some cases. The very anti-Marxist, certainly. Um, not so big into the on freedom of expression. So th that's what fascists were. Now Falange was actually anti-clerical at the first, although they were right wingers in many respects. What was unusual for Spanish right wingery is they thought that the Catholic Church had overweening influence, but they did change their mind on that one and achieve reconciliation with the Catholic Church, which was a very potent force, particularly in the countryside, particularly amongst um, women and all the less educated people. Remember, almost no Spanish women got to go to higher education in those days. So July 1936, the Civil War erupted and um, um, he was, he was in, in Morocco commanding the Army of Africa. How are they going to get to the mainland? The Spanish Navy mostly took the side of the um, Spanish Republic. So you had Republicans and Nationalists. The Republicans wanted to defend the Republic. They were Social Democrats, Liberals, uh, Anarchists, Communists. Communists of both the Trotskyite and the Stalinist stripe who absolutely hated each other. There were Catalan Nationalists, Basque Nationalists. Whereas on the, 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 the um, Nationalist side, those who favored the unity of Spain, Spanish nationalists, Spain must stay one, and that includes the Basque Country and Catalonia are not allowed to go independent. They would be um, uh, conservatives, monarchists, uh, fascists, um, and so forth. Some, even some right-wing liberals, liberals who were unhappy with fascism but thought we have to team up with them because the communists are, are, are the worst and we have to do anything to, to defeat the absolute evil of communism. We don't want to be horrifically oppressed and massacred as they are in the Soviet Union. So uh, the nationalists often had as their uh, slogan, España una grande y libre, one great and free. So the unity of Spain, they thought it would be mightier uh, under their rule and free. Well, obviously you'd be very unfree if you had communist rule, but you'd be no freedom of expression, no property rights, no religious liberty, and many people starved to death 
in the Soviet Union. Um, so how are they going to get from uh, North Africa to the Spanish mainland? Because the Republican government, they, they, they posted suspect generals, those of dubious loyalty, to places like the Canary Islands, the Balearics, and Morocco. Then they keep them as far away from Madrid as possible. But anyway, they, the, the nationalists appealed to Adolf Hitler for help. He was Chancellor of Germany and indeed President of Germany at the same time. And he sent various um, planes, Juncker transport planes, and he airlifted them to the mainland. And eventually they got some ships too. Benito Mussolini was the fascist prime minister of Italy, and he helped out as well. But I won't give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of the civil war, but um, it took almost three years. Um, so the Italian and German government helping. There was this um, non-intervention agreement between France, United Kingdom, Italy, various other countries. Obviously, Italy was flagrantly breaking it. The Soviet Union assisted the, the um, Republicans, sent not many troops, few trainers, a bit of equipment, and said, well, we'll look after your gold reserves. So the Spanish Republic sent its reserves out of the Bank of Spain to Moscow and never been seen again. Um, and the Spain was often asking for it after the, after the war, but the Soviets stonewalled. Um, so um, the, the French were deeply concerned because obviously Spain borders them. There's a considerable Spanish community in Spain then as there, back then as there is now, uh, like Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali, spent their whole adult lives there. Um, so they were worried this would spill over into France and be a civil war in France. And remember that French politics was very polarized as well. Had a large and noisy communist party ruled by the Socialist Party. There was also, the right wingers were quite reactionary. There's a sort of French fascist movement too. But anyway, democracy survived in France, but there, it, was a, it was a shaky moment for stability in France. It was seriously suffering from the Great Depression. You've got to remember there was mass unemployment in many countries. In Spain, there was a lot of poverty anyway. But when the Great Depression sunk, uh, struck, a lot of people were malnourished. Anyway, so uh, the French, British, and so on said, we can't, we can't intervene because if the Soviet Union and, uh, is on one side and the Italians and Germans on the other side, that's a bit like a Second World War. And we don't want that to happen. Remember, there's very much in the shadow of the First World War, not 20 years earlier, it had ended. So people were very aware of this. And so it was sort of a testing ground for um, German weapon systems, their, their Stuka dive bombers. And notoriously, they bombed Guernica, this market town of no particular military significance, and killed hundreds of people. You may know the famous Picasso painting thereof, the Freedom Tree in the middle of the city as well. There's even a novel entitled The Freedom Tree about it. So the, the Luftwaffe was there. Um, not many German ground troops. For young officers, it was thought to be fantastic for them to actually be battle-hardened to see, do they have the sand? Can they take it being under fire? so that if we ever do go to war, they've actually experienced a bit of comment, uh, combat. Hello, Diane Malloy. I'm glad that you find me scintillating to listen to. So keep the wax out your ears. And the Italian cell sent Il Corpo di Truppi Volontari, the, um, the Corps of Volunteer Troops, but they weren't, weren't volunteers in most cases, sent um, tens of thousands of men. And uh, they were not all poltroons, as people claim. Um, but the, the Mussolini didn't want to suffer too many deaths. But again, for his junior officers, he felt it was a superb, well, live fire exercise almost. The war, to, the war wasn't crucial for Italy, it didn't have to be too heavily committed. Remember, the Italians were still battling to um, suppress Abyssinia back then, that's Ethiopia. Their war in Abyssinia nearly just ended, but uh, guerrilla resistance carried on. So um, anyway, Ma Madrid was the capital of Spain. They'd almost captured it early in the war. The thing is that the nationalists, so to simplify a little bit, they, they were stronger in the um, western part of the country and the, the Republicans in the eastern half of the country. The Republicans are most in the cities. Um, and there was uh, one nationalist commander who's advancing on Madrid, which is very lightly guarded. But um, then he was signaled by a, um, he was radioed by a nationalist garrison who was surrounded by a Republican saying, we're, we're surrounded, we're heavily outnumbered, we're running low on ammunition, please come and relieve us. If you don't, we'll be obliged to surrender in a couple of days. This Nash's commander, what should you do? Go for the main prize and take Madrid, or change direction and, liber and, and um, relieve this Nash's garrison, which is otherwise going to be obliged to capitulate. So he decided he would go and relieve his comrades, and he did. He successfully lifted the siege. The Republicans no longer investigate, invested that position, and that was that. However, that was a crucial delay of a few days, allowing the Republicans time to rush more troops to Madrid, and by then it was too strongly defended, and the, the um, nationalists were not able to dislodge the Republicans for, for a few years, well, about two years. So um, there were four nationalist columns surrounding Madrid. How are you going to take Madrid, uh, a nationalist commander was asked, he said, with my fifth column. Um, meaning as in he had secret national supporters inside Madrid who were keen to raise la sangre y oro, the blood and gold, as in the flag of 
of, of nationalist Spain, was the flag of Spain even today, whereas the Spanish Republic, oh my goodness, I'm trying to, it's, it's just too sunny, trying to block it out with my head. I hope the color contrast isn't too much. Okay, this is just getting ridiculous. <laughs> um, uh, he said uh, that's how he was gonna do it. Is that better? All right, I'm just gonna change direction again. Sorry about this. Um, uh, the son of Spain, eh? Um, that's why we have the expression fifth columnist as in secret supporters wherever the enemy within. Um, so the, 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 the uh, Republicans even found time to hold an Olympiad in Barcelona because the Olympics was going on in Germany. They said, oh, we mustn't support fascism. Good, now that's better, is it? Yeah, a bit, a bit too bright for me though. I mean, it's not too bright for you seeing, and I can't see my screen with my notes here. Um, anyway, so uh, Franco wasn't necessarily the leader of the, of the Republic, so the nationalists to begin with, but eventually the other generals decided they would accept his supremacy. So um, the international brigades were formed. Various foreign volunteers came to uh, Spain from Yugoslavia, then existed the United States, um, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy. So and often German and Italian refugees from fascism came, to, he came here. And they fought these international brigades, but anyway, they eventually lost. And there were, of course, some foreigners who volunteered for the nationalist side, Frenchmen, Irishmen, Englishmen, I can't think of other nationalities. Um, Okay, so, um, yeah, in 19th March 1939, La Guerra Afinada, the Republicans had been defeated and their leadership fled, they were imprisoned, they had to work on roads, and tens of thousands were executed afterwards. Read Paul Preston about this, the Spanish Holocaust. So, um, anyway, he was neutral in the First World, sorry, in the Second World War, the country was wrecked. Okay, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, so many buildings have been destroyed, it wasn't a wealthy developed country, been very heavily dependent on Italian and um, uh, German help to win the war. Portugal was ruled by this right-wing authoritarian dictator, um, Salazar, who didn't actually intervene on his side, well, didn't send troops, but was highly sympathetic, provided log logistical assistance. So, um, there was only one political party then in Spain allowed, El Movimiento Nacional, as in the national movement, uh, so, uh, and Hitler was all saying, you know, help me. When he conquered France, Hitler went to Hendai, the extreme um, southwest corner of France, the border with Spain, and uh, Franco arrived by train. There's famous footage of the meeting, and it was, it was praising Hitler to the moon. It was deeply in Hitler's debt. Plus, Hitler was the mightiest man in the world. He could scarcely afford to offend him. He did send a Division Azul um, there, as in the blue division of um, Spanish troops to, to to the Soviet front who are willing to help Germany. Um, hi there, who's that? Reality is an illusion. Well, I don't think it is an illusion, actually. Trouble is, I can scarcely see this screen because it's so bright here. Perhaps it was a mistake to do it outside, especially um, almost at midday. Um, anyway, so there wasn't great freedom of expression. King Alfonso was, was in exile in Rome, and uh, then his uh, grandson, Juan Carlos, was born. Um, and that was that. So there was... There was um, partisan resistance by Republicans into the 1950s, particularly the mountains, and they were finally cleared out comprehensively. There was compulsory military service in Spain at the time. Obviously, Catholicism was brought back at the state religion. Um, the Republicans had viciously persecuted Catholicism, um, murdered hundreds of monks, priests, and uh, nuns, and taken over church buildings, but suddenly that was back with a vengeance. Franco, in his speeches, would often denounce the Jewish Masonic Communist conspiracy. Um, but the, the Jews were not actually persecuted under him. The Jewish minority was allowed to worship. He did compile a list of who they were and people saying he was going to hand them over to the, um, to, to, to the Third Reich, although actually that never happened. Um, anyway, so um, he was allowed to, Spain was allowed to join NATO in 1949. It's very useful to NATO. And indeed, President Eisenhower visited. People say, oh, well, doesn't this make a mockery of American claim to promote democracy when they allowed this um, military dictatorship um, to join? Um, so... Uh, America was married, he had children, but he wasn't going to nominate one of his sons as, as his heir. And the Spanish royal family was invited back in 1949, and he groomed Juan Carlos to be, to be king. Juan Carlos, born 1938. He was going to skip a generation, go from Alfonso XIII to Alfonso XIII's grandson. Can you impersonate John Merker order? I find it funny how he says, oh, Okay, order, order, order. You are on incorrigible reprobate at times. What do you think? Okay. So um, he was increasingly losing the plot in the early 70s. The Spanish economy was finally picking up a bit of tourism, a bit of immorality. Um, 
there was a lot of hypocrisy because obviously sex outside of marriage was a big no-no. He didn't want any contraception. Obviously, abortion was illegal. Um, but um, the Western tourists, well, particularly British and French and German tourists were coming here, getting up to hijinks. Um, and that was that he decided to grant independence to Equatorial Guinea and Africa in the 60s. Perhaps surprising. Um, but it, by the early 70s, it wasn't really ruling because it was going a bit gaga. But he lived in great luxury. He was known as Captain General, the title for the king previously. How about a sassy Trump? Oh, Alan Gibbon, just watch my comedy channel, George Callahan Comedy. Look that up on YouTube, George Callahan Comedy. Um, it's very early 1975, um, and the Catalan and Basque separatists began um, a bombing campaign and managed to assassinate Serrano Sunier, uh, one of his key cabinet ministers, who indeed was married to Franco's daughter. So people who were caught were garroted, were, were strangled, that's the way they were executed. Um, and 1975 became clear he was going to die. He'd already proclaimed that Juan Carlos, who was 38, was going to become king, that were going to restore the monarchy. And he felt he groomed Juan Carlos, who was going to be sufficiently reactionary. And then it was announced that he was gravely ill in October 1975. And a British journalist who flew out to Spain to report the death of Franco. And he was waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, and finally, after six weeks, Franco died, the 20th of November, 1975. Now, on the 20th of November, 1936, um, Antonio uh, Prima de Rivera had been executed, a nationalist ideologue and uh, lawyer. And so some people said, because he was sort of an icon of the nationalist movement, that they'd kept Franco alive, so he'd die on that auspicious date, also the 20th of November. He used to see memorials to um, Antonio Prima de Rivera all around, as in the son of the previous um, dictator, Antonio Primo de Rivera. No idea. I'm, I missed that about California. Oda! 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 No, it's um, O space D-A-H. But uh, So that, that was the end of Franco, and he had many estates, and people were being forced to donate to a big house of his near Ferrol. But um, then you can see the footage of Juan Carlos when he became king, saying, Joró por Dios y sus santos angelios de, um, what is it, guardar los leos fundamentales del reino y a la alta de los principios que informan el movimiento nacional, and so on. So then he was proclaimed um, king of Spain, and he gradually democratized. It was phased in over about seven years. The Communist Party was unbanned. Dolores Ibarruri returned to, to, to Spain, La Pasionara, as in the passionate one. She was this famous communist um, broadcaster in the Civil War. Um, he was always famous saying, no pasarán, they shall not pass. As in, the, the, the nationalists will not take Madrid. Well, they did take Madrid. Um, and she'd obviously gone into exile in Moscow for almost 40 years. A very elderly woman allowed back. You know, Catalan and, and, and Basque national identity could be expressed again. They got a lot of autonomy, and that was that. And indeed, uh, Juan Carlos, he set his face against a golpe de estado, an attempted at military putsch by one of the Guardia Civil in 1982, who uh, tried to kidnap everyone in the Cortes, uh, saying, what is it? Uh, I can't remember, he called them some swear word like cunts, todos al suelo, as in everybody on the ground. And, and Juan Carlos broadcast said, no, this is absolutely unacceptable. I'm commander of the chief of the armed forces. You will, you will fight against this mutiny. And that was that. But anyway, it was right after Franco's death, he was, he was buried in, in Valle de los Caídos. Should he be reinterred? Now, there used to be many statues of him that have been removed. There used to be many public places named after him. So the public space, people say, we should not be honoring a dishonorable man. I'm Diane. I'm watching from America in Wisconsin. Hello there, Diane. So please subscribe. Ask your friends and neighbors to subscribe. Request me to make videos. Um, I'm, I've got a Patreon account and PayPal account. I rely on donations to sustain this channel. Um, so give with extraordinary liberality. But um, coming back to, to Franco, well, having, having uh, limbed his life in, in a little detail, I can now talk about uh, the, the pros and cons of reburying him. You are you're great doing that accent. Ah, many thanks. Hi, George. Do you think Juan Assange's, uh, Julian Assange's cruel incarceration? Well, I mean, he skipped bail. He got a 12-month sentence. He'll only serve six the way it goes in the UK. Hello, reality. Um, so whether he should be extradited to, to Sweden, I think that the charge has been dropped actually of, of, of unlawful intercourse, or the United States, we'll see. He probably will be extradited to the United States. I mean, you, you can't reveal tens of thousands of top secret documents and expect there to be no repercussions. Uh, I know he was revealing war crimes in some cases, but I think, you know, six months for skipping bail is not that harsh. Um, he could have turned up at the hearing. He might have won his case 10 years ago. 
Anyway, let me get back to the topic at hand, please, because uh, I'm talking about the particulars of whether uh, uh, Franco ought to be reburied or not. She's a hate figure on many of the left. Some people see him as the, the Spanish Hitler. Uh, so I, mean, I, I tend not to want to um, uh, disinter people, keep the monument there. It's a fascinating historical phenomenon, as well as being artistically beautiful. I know you're going to say what it stands for is far from beautiful. In fact, it's, it's a hideous um, oppression. So we can also judge him as a man at his time. Some of his foes were also terrible. He was battling against Stalin. Put yourself in 1936. Um, you know, in Nazi Germany, certainly 700 people have been killed by the government. In Italy, very, very few people have been killed by the government, in the dozens, I suppose. Now, it's true that in Abyssinia, there have been massacres by the Italian military. What do you think our reality is in the situation? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't want to get onto that, sorry. Hi, Gisley Maxwell seems to disappear. Do you think the UK police will question her? Well, possibly. Most of the crimes are supposed to supposedly committed in the United States, more likely the police in the US will question her because she supposedly was holed up in somebody's estate somewhere in New England. But back to um, Franco. So those we have to go digging up people because they did what we now recognize was wrong. I mean, obviously in the 30s, some people thought this was very wrong. His enemies did uh, terrible things too. You could say he overthrew democracy. Well, the election results were very dubious. There's a lot of political violence already and Spain needed order more than anything, but starting a civil war wasn't really order. So there were a few good things about him. He prevented uh, communism taking over. But yeah, there were certainly bad things about him. I mean, he anti has anti-Semitism and very little freedom of expression. So you don't have to hold a brief for Franco to say, no, we should not go around digging people up and moving them here and there and removing statues. Then we'd have little, very little public art left. You might say, oh, we'll, we'll keep his tomb. We'll just move his body. What would that achieve? I suppose some closure for people say, oh, my grandfather was killed by his, by his uh, troops. So yeah, that's my take on it. I'm generally against it. Even Lenin, even though I detest him, I wouldn't rebury him. I'd leave him in situ. So please uh, post your comments below, request more videos and donate on Patreon. See my Instagram account, Twitter and Facebook. See my articles, which I also put on my Facebook account from George Ireland on Facebook, my, my newspaper articles. Goodbye.